Welcome to the second season of Women at Iowa, a program that explores the experience, work, and lives of women on the University of Iowa campus. I'm your host, Anna Bostwick Fleming, and our guest today is Jennifer Glass. She's a professor of sociology at the University of Iowa and also chair of the Department of Women's Studies. She's also the 2007 winner of the Jean Y. Jew Women's Rights Award. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. So I know that you were born and raised in Dallas, that you were college educated in Florida and Wisconsin, and that you spent 11 years on the faculty at the University of Notre Dame, and before that, the University of Southern California. How did you end up in Iowa? Well, I was at the University of Notre Dame, and I had two very young children. And I was very concerned about the quality of the public schooling in the area. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about the quality of life for my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was invited to come to the University of Iowa. It had a wonderful sociology department that mm -hmm. was very highly ranked. And I was thrilled to be able to make a, a literally a lateral move. I mean, I just sort of mm -hmm. moved from one section of Interstate 80 to another section of Interstate 80. <laughs> And, uh, and loved it here. It was just a wonderful place uh, mm -hmm. for me career-wise, and it was also a wonderful place for my children to grow up. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you have said that your children forged the subject matter of your professional career as a researcher. Can you talk about some of the ways that your personal life has influenced your uh, work as a sociologist? Yes. I started out interested in inequality and stratification, mm -hmm. sort of what are the forces that position people in uh, different places after they finish school and enter the workforce. And mm -hmm. it has such huge impacts on their life chances, mm -hmm. on their health, um, on the quality of the neighborhood they live in, and everything else about their lives. So I was specifically interested in gender inequality. Mm -hmm. I am one of those people that was the beneficiary of the second women's mm -hmm. movement. Uh, all sorts of educational opportunities were opening up. And mm -hmm. I thought that I would combine these interests by studying gender stratification. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, everyone was concerned about the gender wage gap and mm -hmm. when was it going to go away and what was causing it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people focused just on occupational choices that women made. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that it was more than just the occupational choices that women made, mm -hmm. that it had to do with the structure of the workforce itself. Mm -hmm. So I was groping around with that that topic in my mm -hmm. dissertation and in some of my early work, mm -hmm. trying to explain why women seem to be satisfied with jobs that weren't very satisfying, mm -hmm. uh, why they couldn't get better employment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I had my first child and it was sort of an epiphany, it was sort of the lightning bolt came down and said, oh, this is why. Mm -hmm. um, I already knew that childbearing had a big impact on women's careers, but it mm -hmm. wasn't until I had my own daughter that I mm -hmm. really felt it viscerally on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. When you realize that your child care arrangement has fallen through, it's now 8.30 in the morning, you have mm -hmm. a 9 o'clock class to teach, mm -hmm. and you have a screaming six-month-old baby at your mm -hmm. feet. The immediacy of that need for mm -hmm. child care that's reliable and low cost and high mm -hmm. quality hits you in a way that it doesn't when you're just studying it as an academic topic. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot more than that. Um, mm -hmm. I was at an institution that had no maternity leave, mm -hmm. so which I, I, I found kind of troubling, but also kind of bizarre, mm -hmm. uh, because it really revealed the extent to which workplaces that were employing professional and managerial workers did not expect them to be women. Mm -hmm. So there was sort of a built-in assumption that if you were here, mm -hmm. you would never be pregnant, you would never mm -hmm. have bodily needs, mm -hmm. you would never have a small child that you would be responsible for caring mm -hmm. for on a 24-hour-a-day basis. Mm -hmm. So that seemed to me to be the opening for an entire new career, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much the career that I've had, is exploring <laughs> how motherhood and how parenthood more generally mm -hmm. shapes careers. Mm -hmm. And when you had your your first child, you were actually pre-tenure, right? Yes. yes. And, and how, how difficult was that? Was that something that people would have been supportive at that time? This was the late 1980s, right? Right. Um, I was very, very fortunate in that I was in a, in a department that had two endowed chairs who were both women. Mm -hmm. So they were at a different point in their career. Um, one of them had children, one of them didn't. Mm -hmm. But I knew that they were very supportive of me as a faculty member. So mm -hmm. I approached uh, pregnancy with less fear, I think, than I might have if everyone in my department had been male and, and none mm -hmm. of them had, had ever cared for children themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but one in particular told me that if I allowed my work life to determine what the rest of my life would be, mm -hmm that I would regret it later mm -hmm. on in life, that no one, whatever the cliche is about, you know, no one ever said on their deathbed that they wish they'd spend more mm -hmm. time at the office. And her words really struck home with me. Mm -hmm. um, like most academic women, I faced that biological clock ticking. If I waited mm -hmm. until after tenure, I would be even older. Mm -hmm. What were the possibilities of a second child going to be? Mm -hmm. So I decided to bite the bullet and do it. Mm -hmm. I think I was the first pregnant, untenured faculty member <laughs> at the University of Notre Dame. My goodness. <laughs> 
<laughs> and um, I, I was going up for tenure that year, so I did have a certain sense of, well, it's too late now. Uh, there's nothing more I can do. The die has been cast uh -huh. either way. Uh, so I'll just have the baby during the year when they're making the decision about me. Um, and, and I was fairly confident going in. Uh, but again, I was fairly confident going in, not understanding just how deep the responsibilities of caring for that infant were going mm -hmm. to be and how much they were going to interfere with mm -hmm. um, the rest of my academic life. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say that that one uh, faculty member, her name was Maureen Hallinan, mm -hmm. was extremely influential. I also had a department chair the following year who uh, bucked convention and said, I don't think it's fair for someone with a six-month-old, uh, six-week, excuse me, six-week-old baby oh to have to come goodness. back and teach full-time, uh, arranged for me to have one course off when I returned. So mm -hmm. um, he was uh, extremely kind in that fashion mm -hmm. and extremely tolerant. I have to say that I was a little bit militant about the fact that I mm -hmm. was a new parent and that I thought this was important and that mm -hmm. if we really valued children, mm -hmm. we would make room for this in our lives. So if people scheduled me for things at 4.30 mm -hmm. or 5 in the afternoon, I would just bring the baby. Mm -hmm. Hopefully she would sleep. If she didn't sleep, I didn't care. So mm -hmm. I have to say, in retrospect, now that I'm a department chair, I look back on that and I would say it's very rude behavior. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, um, like I said, I felt very strongly that um, if I was going to be expected to do things beyond the traditional hours of a mm -hmm. nine to five workday, mm -hmm. someone was going to have to sit up and take notice that there were other mm -hmm. things in my life that were going to interfere mm -hmm. with that. So. Yeah, so you must have changed things for sure, but I'm wondering, did you change things in that the next woman who got pregnant prior to tenure or even after tenure, was she able to have, you know, uh, time off for nursing or whatever? Or were you just more of uh, an inspiration to people who were, who were facing similar I, challenges? I can't say how much I personally accomplished, but uh -huh. I do know that one of the things that I did while I was still at that institution was that I started a campus child care coalition. Oh, wow. Uh, we had a series of events on campus to indicate to the administration how dire the need for child care was. Mm -hmm. There was a one child care center that held 70 students. It was at the women's college across the street. Mm -hmm. and and it had a waiting list that was longer than the enrollment. <laughs> so um, I think as a result of the attention that we brought to the issue, mm -hmm. as well as I think some of the political pressures that were brought to bear, it was mm -hmm. a Catholic institution, there was a second uh, much larger child care center built on campus mm -hmm. about the time that I left. So I mm -hmm. do feel like there was um, a lot of movement when I was there and mm -hmm. that I was somehow instrumental in helping move that mm -hmm. along. The question of parental leave is a, is a tougher one. I know mm -hmm. that since I left, that institution has introduced a parental leave for both women mm -hmm. and men that's fairly generous. Mm -hmm. um, I worked very hard here at the University of Iowa for two years working on a gender equity committee to create a similar policy here. We're in a mm -hmm. little bit different situation here because we're part of a group of state employees, mm -hmm. and so the the comparisons that are made across different groups of state employees, I think, uh, are greater and mm -hmm. the desire for more consistency. So I don't think we were as successful here, but I'm hopeful that things will change. They're certainly mm -hmm. changing everywhere else. So <laughs> I think eventually the University of Iowa will change as well. Oh, that's great. Well, so some of your current research is very related to this. You look at the relationship between work family policies and income. Can you tell me some of the most important conclusions that you've been able to make from this research? Well, it's kind of a good news, bad news story. Mm -hmm. The good news is that employers who have strong work family policies are a lot more likely to retain their talent. Mm -hmm. So as their young workers go through their family formation years, they're much more likely to stay with an employer that they mm -hmm. perceive as supportive. Mm -hmm. So uh, a longer paid parental leave is going to keep them on the job. Having child care assistance is going to keep them on the job. But probably most important is having flexibility in the hours that they work, both mm -hmm. in the location of those hours and also in the timing of those hours. Mm -hmm. So when employers do that, employees respond quite favorably. Mm -hmm. The downside is that employees who take advantage of these policies seem to be, I hate to use the word mommy tracked, but I mm -hmm. think they're, they're sort of um, stymied in terms mm -hmm. of career growth. Mm -hmm. So anyone who takes advantage of any of these policies seems to be getting labeled in a particularly negative fashion. Mm -hmm. So their wage growth is slow over time and they're less likely to receive promotions during that time. Mm -hmm. um, at first I thought, well, perhaps they're less productive, perhaps there's something going on that mm -hmm. makes this a reasonable conclusion for an employer to, to draw if you're working flexible hours and you know, maybe this mm -hmm. isn't the time to promote you or give you a big pay raise. Um, but then I started looking at people who had quit and moved on to different employers. And there you see in pretty stark relief that if you are using, say, a flexible employment schedule and finding your wages stalemated, mm -hmm. if you quit and go to another employer who doesn't know your history, doesn't mm -hmm. know what you've done in the past, your wages start to rise quite dramatically. Oh. So that seemed to me to be an indication that it's a labeling process, mm -hmm. that um, 
people who take advantage of work family policies are seen somehow as not on the fast track, not the movers and shakers in the organization, mm -hmm. and that this seems to be independent of effort or ability or results. Mm -hmm. Because these same people, once they move to a different employer, mm -hmm. seem to be taking off and uh, actually earning faster salary increases than they would have um, had they not had the child at all. So mm -hmm. there's something going on here within an organization. So mm -hmm. I think it has to do with organizational dynamics. Wow. Well, you've also done some research on the relationship between religious conservatism and parental obligations and waged work. Can you talk a little bit about what you found that's surprising in that particular Yes, study? I came to this research through a circuitous route. I was really interested in why the wage gap had stalled. So mm -hmm. remember, I started out looking at the gender <laughs> wage gap. And uh, we made progress, considerable progress, throughout the 1970s, 1980s, and into the 1990s. And then about the mid-1990s, we just stopped making progress. And we started hearing opt-out stories uh, that women were leaving the labor force when they had children and mm -hmm. all kinds of other things. Now, it turns out that some of these are so-called trends are really exaggerated. But mm -hmm. it did seem to me that there had been a stagnation. There was no more progress being made in closing the gender wage gap. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that this was precisely the era where we were seeing the first generation of young people who were raised in conservative Protestant households mm -hmm. hit their young adult years. Mm -hmm. And it all of a sudden started to make sense to me that we had kind of a, a new right movement within religion that mm -hmm. strongly emphasized differentiated roles for women and men within mm -hmm. the family and strongly emphasized um, early marriage and procreation Mm -hmm. and uh, we're not real keen on family limitation. Mm -hmm. So I started trying to figure out if this could possibly be the explanation for the stagnation, that we were mm -hmm. seeing new entrants into the labor force who were much more likely to be conservative on these gender issues and were much mm -hmm. more likely to form traditional marriages and withdraw from the labor force when they had children. Mm -hmm. So I took a couple of data sets and tried to see if this was in fact the case. And I was surprised. I, I actually was skeptical. I didn't think mm -hmm. that it was really going to matter. Um, within academia at least, we tend to think of people's ideological commitments as really nice, but they don't really <laughs> motivate behavior. Uh -huh. So people talk a lot of talk, but they very seldom mm -hmm. do things that are against their material interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was quite surprised to find out that indeed this was a very strong indicator mm -hmm. of early marriage, early childbearing. So people who were raised mm -hmm. in a uh, fundamentalist or conservative Protestant household were much more likely to form families young, mm -hmm. truncate their education, mm -hmm. and then have very gender differentiated lives. Mm -hmm. So the women were dropping out of the labor force when they had children. Mm -hmm. um, they were less likely to work full time even before they had children, mm -hmm. and showed markedly lower wages in adulthood mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the sad part of the story is that that would be lovely if they weren't subject to the same kinds of material risks mm -hmm. that the rest of us were, but it turns out their divorce rates are just as high. In mm -hmm. fact, they're a little bit higher than people who are um, not raised in conservative mm -hmm. religious households. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it is potentially at least a problem. They've withdrawn from the labor force. They've truncated their ability to earn an income. But a mm -hmm. lot of these mothers will find themselves as single parents at some future mm -hmm. point in time. Wow. Well, I've read some of your research on this. And you talk a little bit about how um, religious, conservative, um, religious conservatism seems to talk some about the importance of fatherly involvement in mm -hmm. children's lives. And what are some of the results of when you looked into that as far as yes. who does what? Um, as it turns out, um, conservative Protestant fathers do indeed spend a significant amount of time with their children. Mm -hmm. um, there's some research that suggests that they spend more time with their children mm -hmm. than do fathers who grow up in uh, mainline religious households. Mm -hmm. I didn't find that at all. Um, mm -hmm. I found that participation rates were about the same. Mm -hmm. They're less likely to participate in housework than our men who are raised in mainline <laughs> religions. So mm -hmm. the involvement that they have with their children is much more about extracurricular activities, disciplinary mm -hmm. activities, mm -hmm. um, religious activities, and religious mentoring. Mm -hmm. So in, in those respects, you do see a slight benefit mm -hmm. uh, coming from a religiously conservative mm -hmm. household. Mm -hmm. But overall, we see them doing less housework mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and less physical child care than men who are raised mm -hmm. in mainline religious denominations. Mm -hmm. And does that affect the, the way that both men and women in these families into the workforce and what they do there? Um, I didn't find that so much. What I did find is that the women, when they enter the labor force, are much likely, much likelier to enter occupations that are traditionally female occupations, mm -hmm. and those also pay uh, less. Mm -hmm. The men, on the other hand, are more likely to enter traditionally male occupations, mm -hmm. um, although I didn't find that they were experiencing any wage boost from that. In fact, um, 
the men raised in conservative households suffered a slight wage decline relative to men in similar situations who were not mm -hmm. raised in those religiously conservative households. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure what exactly what that's about. Mm -hmm. uh, so the women take kind of a big hit in wages, the men take a little mm -hmm. hit in wages. Mm -hmm. So I guess from per personal experience and also from academic experience, knowing about these things, what sort of advice do you give to women in particular who are trying to balance advancing their careers with family obligations? Um, I'm, I'm not the best source of advice, <laughs> I have to say, because I think I've been the fortunate recipient of a lot of serendipitous mm -hmm. uh, actions on the part of other people. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that one of the things that you do is that you make sure you've got a good employment record, you mm -hmm. make sure that you have covered your bases with the people that you're working with mm -hmm. before you decide to have a family and decide how you're going to rearrange your work life. So there's nothing that smooths your path more than being a valued, talented worker. Um, your employer is much more likely to say yes to any kinds of concessions that you ask for. Mm -hmm. If you've proven that you're a hard worker, if you've proven that you do a quality job at whatever mm -hmm. it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, having said that though, I also think it's important for people to not underestimate what they can get if they negotiate, mm -hmm. uh, for people to not underestimate their value to an employer, mm -hmm. and for people to not underestimate what they deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very hard because in this country we're basically taught that we really deserve nothing mm -hmm. from our employers and from our society, that mm -hmm. having children is an individual personal act and that you suffer individual personal consequences of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in many, many other countries, childbearing and the treatment of children is considered much more of a collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. So everybody remembers Hillary Clinton saying it yes. takes a village to raise a child. It really does. Mm -hmm. there, there are no parents who can do this solo, mm -hmm. who can do this without any assistance. So in the U.S. we've gone too far in the opposite direction. We've made this too much of an individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we see parents struggling. We see fertility rates very low mm -hmm. among native-born Americans. And we see high rates of child poverty mm -hmm. and lots of problems um, health problems as well as cognitive developmental problems mm -hmm. among young children that you don't see in countries that see this as a collective responsibility. So mm -hmm. I constantly am telling people, stick up for yourself, stick up for your child, because in mm -hmm. that process you're sticking up for all parents and all children. Mm -hmm. So every time you complain about something or negotiate for <laughs> something, you're, an en you're enlightening an mm -hmm. employer and you're enlightening your coworkers that new college students and new workers don't just spring forth from the head of <laughs> Zeus like, uh, like the goddess Athena did. Mm -hmm. um, they have to be carefully nurtured and somebody has to do that nurturing. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to do that bearing of children and then somebody has to do that nurturing of children. Yeah. Great. Well, like I said before, in 2007, you won the Jean Y. Jew Women's Rights Award. Um, that award is for your outstanding effort or achievement in improving the status of women at the University of Iowa. That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about uh, how you won that award and about what the award means to you? I'm not quite sure how I won the award. I know that mm -hmm. somebody nominated <laughs> me, and it was very lovely of them to do that. Um, I. Uh, I have to say it was one of the biggest honors that I've ever received in my life because mm -hmm. um, you do a lot of research, you do a lot of writing, it goes off into the world and you just sort of wonder, is anybody reading this? <laughs> Does anybody care? <laughs> uh, you try very hard as an administrator because I was a department chair of a different unit before I had mm -hmm. my current appointment. You try to do the right thing, you try to institute policies that you think are consistent with your values, mm -hmm. but you never know if they're going to outlive you. Mm -hmm. um, so you know as long as you're in charge, things will work that way, but you never know if things will continue to work that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was lucky enough to see some of the changes that I instituted in my department institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to have some policymakers who took some notice of my written work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, and it's always thrilling because um, then you know that your work didn't go out into the void mm -hmm. and disappear, that mm -hmm. someone paid attention. Mm -hmm. I just found out, for example, yesterday that um, someone I've participated in roundtables and conferences with for many, many years mm -hmm. may be the new appointee to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission under the Obama administration. Wow. Um, and the first thing I thought of was, oh my gosh, I might have access to somebody who's on the <laughs> EEOC. Uh, so I think that that's pretty much the way policy gets made, mm -hmm. is that you have a good idea, you have some changes you want to make, and all of a sudden you or a friend or mm -hmm. somebody you know through work mm -hmm. has a position of power where they might be able to change things. Mm -hmm. So to me that's the biggest thrill, and I hope that it's for my small part in trying to push these issues forward that I won the Jean Jew Award. Mm -hmm. 
And you talked about some of these um, changes you'd implemented in your own unit or some ideas that you that had other people took notice of. Can you tell me what maybe you're most proud of? Uh, I think there are a couple of things that have worked out very well. One is to have flexibility in scheduling a wide variety of academic responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So we have this sense that if a course load is two classes a semester, then it mm -hmm. should be two classes every semester. Mm -hmm. And we experimented, particularly with new parents, with a one-three load. Mm -hmm. So you teach one class one semester, you teach three classes the next mm -hmm. semester, you shift around your service ob obligations and your research mm -hmm. so that um, you can have a more flexible schedule when your new baby needs it mm -hmm. and have the more defined hours that you have to fill when mm -hmm. you're teaching a lot of classes at a point in time that's more comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we try to introduce flexibility in a wide variety of ways. Mm -hmm. We also try to democratize the process of making assignments, mm -hmm. both administrative assignments and course assignments and mm -hmm. uh, service assignments. So I try to, I, I call it the, the downloading process, I try to get <laughs> individual working groups within the department to decide as much of this as they could and then report back to me and as mm -hmm. chair I usually could accommodate what the mm -hmm. groups wanted to do and it was a lot more efficient than me trying to sit there with a clipboard and <laughs> run around yeah. to one person at a time and then have to disappoint some people because their answers conflicted. Mm -hmm. um, in the HR literature, in the human resources literature, it turns out a lot of companies are trying this sort of team mm -hmm. approach to scheduling. Mm -hmm. uh, in many of the uh, technology fields, this is already in place, that mm -hmm. people work in teams, they decide on their own team schedule, team coverage, when everybody will be on site, when people can work from home, mm -hmm. uh, when people can not show up in the office at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I did some other things that I think uh, probably won't be institutionalized or probably won't last beyond <laughs> my, my own stature as an administrator. But I think just uh, displaying some sensitivity in things like the scheduling of meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got to the University of Iowa, I remember we had an executive committee and people were having trouble finding a time during the week. So. Uh, uh, more senior member of the department said, well, let's just meet on Saturday mornings for lunch, for brunch. Mm -hmm. And I was appalled at mm -hmm. the idea that we would have this important executive committee meeting brunch on Saturdays. Yeah. So I announced that I would do this once mm -hmm. because we seemed to have difficulty in the next couple of weeks, but that I would never do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I became chair, I realized that's vitally important, that you put some boundaries on when people are expected to be available. Mm -hmm. So I didn't schedule meetings that started at 4.30 mm -hmm. or talks that would start at 4.15 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of people who have either children in school, they need mm -hmm. to be there to pick them up, or they have children in daycare and they're going to be charged by the minute. Yes. <laughs> so I always thought, hmm, is this important enough for somebody to be charged by the minute for being late picking up their child? Mm -hmm. And it does make you think a lot more mm -hmm. about what you're imposing on other people. Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, you've actually held several. You've actually held several administrative positions in your career. You were chair of sociology department here. You're current chair of what's still called the women's studies department here, mm -hmm. and you were chair of gender studies at Notre Dame. So, over the course of of those experiences, what would you say has changed about expectations for faculty and for departments? Um, I think that expectations have changed in two kind of contradictory ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the first and biggest change is the increased demand for accountability on the part of faculty. Mm -hmm. So there's a phenomenal amount of memo writing and form filling out that has to be done mm -hmm. to demonstrate that you have in your classes or in your grading or in your whatever, that you have fulfilled all of the university's dictates. You've mm -hmm. spent this much time and fulfilled this writing requirement or you know whatever else it is that you've done. Mm -hmm. So those demands for accountability, I think, don't just come from the university. I think they come from the external constituencies, from the state, and from mm -hmm. parents. And they want to know, as the costs of higher education rise, that, mm -hmm. in fact, they're getting their money's worth. Mm -hmm. So the downside of that for faculty, of course, is that you're not spending the time that you would have spent on your teaching and research on the students themselves and on mm -hmm. training future researchers, but you're spending that time on memo writing. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain frustration that the um, bureaucratic requirements of the job have so visibly increased. Mm -hmm. um, the second, and like I said, so that, that takes your time off in one direction. Mm -hmm. The second change is that faculty are now expected to be far more entrepreneurial. Mm. Uh, if you're a tenured or a tenure track faculty member, part of your job is to now raise money mm -hmm. for the institution. And uh, what that means is really twofold. One is that faculty spend much more time now grant writing mm -hmm. or fellowship writing or whatever else to try and bring money mm -hmm. into the university than they used to. Again, this takes time away from, mm -hmm. from the actual education of students. 
Um, but it also means that there are fewer faculty and more adjunct personnel who are taking over some of the, the teaching. Mm -hmm. So we see many more visitors, many more lecturers, and many more adjunct faculty positions. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid we're moving towards a tracking system within academia mm -hmm. so that some people will have the good, secure, tenured positions mm -hmm. that now involve an awful lot of fundraising. Mm -hmm. And other people are going to get the very low paid or much lower paid, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say very low paid, but much lower paid, less secure employment, that involves teaching um, large courses, mm -hmm. mass numbers of students, mm -hmm. and also any holes in the curriculum mm -hmm. that should be filled by tenured faculty, but an institution can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. And so they bring in more uh, temporary instructors to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are not pleasant changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not happy changes, unfortunately. I wish I could report something <laughs> that I've seen that I could say, oh, this is so much better than it uh -huh. used to be. But I think we're seeing, uh, in particular, again, this peculiarly American tendency to individualize the costs of children. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is the cost of higher education. Mm -hmm. So it strikes me as awful that at the very moment in historical time when having a college degree matters more than it ever did before for mm -hmm. getting a good job, we see the government withdrawing support mm -hmm. from higher education. So just when more citizens need mm -hmm. it, we're going to pull out the rug from under it in terms mm -hmm. of funding. So who ends up paying? Mm -hmm. Well, it ends up devolving back on parents. Mm -hmm. So parents are rightfully concerned about tuition that's rapidly rising all over mm -hmm. the place, and accessibility does dry up when tuition gets mm -hmm. too high. Well, you're chair of the Department of Women's Studies, and that department's seeing a lot of change right now. Can you talk a little bit about the future of that department and maybe of the discipline in general? Yes, I'm very, very excited about the changes that we're undergoing right mm -hmm. now. Um, I think like many other institutions, we're seeing women's studies expand to incorporate a much broader academic area of study. Mm -hmm. So our plan is to become a department of gender, women's, and sexuality studies. Mm -hmm. So we will be looking at the construction of gender and gender identities, mm -hmm. the impact of gender on people's behavior in a wide variety of settings. We'll mm -hmm. be looking comparatively and historically at how our understandings of gender have changed over time. Mm -hmm. And it's a perfect moment to do this mm -hmm. at the University of Iowa and for the state of Iowa because mm -hmm. we know that there's been a tremendous agitation on the part of gay and lesbian, transgendered mm -hmm. and bisexual populations for civil rights. We've mm -hmm. seen the courts in Iowa declare that gays and lesbians have equal rights to marriage. Mm -hmm. So a lot of traditional or conventional understandings of gender are increasingly being questioned. Mm -hmm. This is happening globally. It's not just happening in the United States. So mm -hmm. we're, in, we're in the midst of this very, very huge cultural shift. Mm -hmm. And to be able to be a part of an expanded unit that incorporates all of this in its area of study is going to be very exciting. Mm -hmm. You've talked a little bit about how um, experiencing feminism in your youth has shaped a lot of the paths that you've taken in your life. Um, can you talk a little bit about how various childhood experiences have affected you? Well, I do remember when, uh, when I was little, this shows how old I am, when I was little, girls had to wear dresses to school. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't allowed to wear pants to school until I was in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And then it had to be pants that had a matching top. They had to be made out of the <laughs> same fabric, which... Sounds really peculiar. Uh -huh. I don't know why that was the rule, but mm -hmm. you, they thought they would be pants suits oh, back in the 70s. There were these, these, <laughs> these things called pants suits, and you were supposed to wear those. And I remember as a child going out into the playground in my dresses and my, you know, bobby socks and mm -hmm. loafers, and standing there in the wintertime just huddling in little groups with all of the other girls while mm -hmm. the boys were out playing and crawling mm -hmm. all over the jungle gym and whatever else. And uh, I sort of understood at that point that there was something negative about being a woman, having mm -hmm. to wear this dress, not being able to play on the playground, mm -hmm. uh, later on being told I could wear pants but only if they matched the shirt. Mm -hmm. I, I just sort of understood that there was a status I was being assigned to that was mm -hmm. less than. Mm -hmm. uh, I took some science classes in high school where it was really, really clear on the part of the teacher, particularly in my physics class, that the boys were supposed to be better than the girls. And mm -hmm. if a girl answered a question correctly, it should be a source of shame and embarrassment to the boys. And mm -hmm. the instructor would, you know, click, you aren't going to let a girl beat you, are you? Mm -hmm. So the message came across loud and clear that, well, physics and science was not something that women were supposed to excel at. Mm -hmm. and, and if you did, you were going to be considered really odd and really strange, mm -hmm. um, not in a good way. Mm -hmm. So I knew right from the get-go that I wanted to have a career, I wanted to work, Mm -hmm. I knew that uh, the homemakers and housewives in my neighborhood, and most of the older women were homemakers and housewives, 
were disrespected, mm -hmm. that they did not have the same status in society as people who were employed in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's always struck me as bizarre that people think that that feminism had something to do with the you know, lack of esteem in which housewives were mm -hmm. held. And I was like, mm -hmm. way before there was a feminist <laughs> movement, it was really clear that uh, homemakers were not accorded the same respect. They couldn't get credit in their own names. Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't uh, sign contracts. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do a whole lot of things because they didn't have a connection to the paid economy. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, deferring to their husbands in, in all kinds of matters of household decision making. Mm -hmm. that they were seen as not capable of making those decisions without a husband's approval. Mm -hmm. So I think the notion that housewives were second class citizens were something that in my generation every child knew. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that this was an invention of the feminist movement by any means, mm -hmm. it's always struck me as very bizarre when people <laughs> say that housewives were respected until the feminist movement came mm -hmm. along. I'm like, you must not have been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that um, I was fortunate to see this and then live at a time where there were enough women out agitating for change that I could go to college, I could get a scholarship, mm -hmm. I could get into graduate school, mm -hmm. um, I could find mentors, I could get a job once mm -hmm. I graduated. And I think I was probably the first generation in the 20th century that could do that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you first uh, found sociology as a field that you wanted to study, you were interested in quantitative methodology rather than qualitative. And quantitative methodology was male-dominated then, right? Right. So can you talk a little bit about your experiences dealing with that? Right. Um, as I said, I was usually very good at science and math, but I knew that that was an inappropriate field for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout college, I was interested in coursework that had to do with human interaction in human society, so I mm -hmm. decided to be a sociology major. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got to graduate school, I realized I didn't really know what graduate school was. I just had professors who said, oh, you should go to graduate school. <laughs> so I thought it was, okay, I'll stay in school as long as I can because I'm earning more money here than I could as a full-time secretary. So I should probably just add this as a parenthetical story. Uh, in between college and grad school, I had a summer mm -hmm. in which I had to work full-time to earn some money. So here I was with my bachelor's degree, new college graduate, trying to find a job. And the best job that I could find was as a secretary. And I remember vividly that my take-home pay was $104 a week. Mm -hmm. And then I was offered a graduate teaching assistantship at the University of Wisconsin, and I was paid $125 a week for my part-time, 20-hour-a-week yep. job at the university. And I realized, hmm, I can be a full-time worker as a mm -hmm. woman in a clerical occupation and make nothing, or <laughs> I can <laughs> go to graduate school, get an advanced degree, learn how to teach, and make more money. Mm -hmm. and this was kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> so, uh, so like I said, I, I arrived at graduate school pretty green. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that you do is you get oriented into the department by taking a series of statistics classes. So they let you know this is a research institution mm -hmm. and you're here to do research, not just to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did quite well in those courses, but again, it was considered a very kind of hard male side of sociology. And if you didn't like those courses, you could always wimp out and do this other softer female thing mm -hmm. that they called qualitative sociology, in which you were doing participant observation or you're doing in-depth interviewing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't happen to think of those things as easy or soft anymore, mm -hmm. but at the time that was clearly the characterization of the field. Mm -hmm. And I liked the math and I was good at the math. Mm -hmm. And I had one particular professor who encouraged me to keep going, mm -hmm. um, who, who saw that I had talent in that area. So I pursued it. I was one of a very small number of women who did. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it was a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the negative parts were, I think, the kind of classic male bonding experiences in the classroom. So I had one professor who wanted to let class out early mm -hmm. so that everyone could go home and watch the NFL football game mm -hmm. and invited everybody in the class to come over to his house for a few beers and watch the game. <laughs> And I kind of rolled my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think it was an aha moment for him because he actually noticed me mm -hmm. rolling my eyes. I always sat in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. So here I am, the, you know, the lone female in the class, and I'm rolling my eyes when he talks about the football game and the beers. And, and he got it. Mm -hmm. So he did stop, gave me a long look, and said, of course you're invited. You know, please do come. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of waved him off. But I, I think he got it. I mm -hmm. think he got it for the first time that maybe there were some classroom practices that were chilly. Mm -hmm. for women. Um, I don't think it stopped them from letting class out early so they could watch football <laughs> and then drink beer after that. But, uh, but I, I think it did sort of raise awareness that mm -hmm. not everybody thinks that the mentoring that goes on between students and faculty should include such aggressively male pursuits. Mm -hmm.
Now, you know, he didn't invite everybody out to go hunting or anything like that. But. <laughs> <laughs> and I do realize there are plenty of women out there who like to watch football and drink mm -hmm. beer. I just wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Women at Iowa tradition to ask all of our guests to recommend a book that would help us to know a little bit more about you. So is there a book that you'd like to add to our list? I knew that you were going to ask me this, and this is the hardest <laughs> question in the world to answer. First, I couldn't tell, should I say something, fiction or nonfiction? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, going to, so I'm going to turn it back to you. Do you want the fiction or the nonfiction answer? Because I, I pretty much decided on a book in each category. Oh, well, we want to hear both. You want then. to hear both? Okay. <laughs> um, in the nonfiction category, it would definitely have to be a book by law professor Joan Williams called mm -hmm. Unbending Gender. Mm -hmm. Because I think she managed in this one book that I think was published in 2001, she managed in one book to bring all of these different strands of feminist theory and research together mm -hmm. to sort of analyze why our legal and our judicial systems don't help women workers mm -hmm. advance further faster mm -hmm. and why we are still stuck in this sort of semi-traditional gender arrangement mm -hmm. in which women have just added paid labor onto the labor of taking care of children and families mm -hmm. and elderly members and communities. So that book was highly influential for me. I mm -hmm. still continue to refer to it. Um, I'm working with Joan Williams on a new project to try and figure out, is there a, a legislative route to greater flexibility in the workplace mm -hmm. that would empower parents and help work and family mesh more mm -hmm. readily? In Europe, they're talking about flexicurity, <laughs> which I find a very strange label, but uh -huh. they're talking about ways to change the labor force so that there's less conflict between caring for family and mm -hmm. communities and doing well mm -hmm. at work. So that book's been very influential. On the fiction side, um, I always go back to the same book by Wally Lamb called mm -hmm. I Know This Much Is True mm -hmm. because it's, first of all, it's really big and I got mm -hmm. through the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an impatient person, so that says a lot about the quality of the book. But it starts out as a really dark, depressing book. Mm -hmm. And for the first 150 or 200 pages, it just gets darker and more depressing. Mm -hmm. And you start to think, why on earth am I reading this horrible book about tragedy and a lot of things unfolding that are unremittingly unremitt negative. Mm -hmm. And I think that for many people, that's how they experience the life course. They have a happy childhood, and then mm -hmm. adulthood hits, and it's just one thing after another after another, and all of a sudden you're stressed and you're overwhelmed and mm -hmm. nothing seems to be working out, and maybe throw in a divorce there or a disabled child, and mm -hmm. life just gets really tough. Mm -hmm. And then about uh, halfway through the book, you start to see this slow, nascent turnaround. And one by one, the obstacles fall away. One by one, uh, people's inherent goodness comes out. The ambiguity of good and evil within each one of us is revealed, mm -hmm. so the villains don't seem quite so villainous, the mm -hmm. uh, angels don't seem quite so angelic, and by the end of the book there's this incredibly satisfying sense of empowerment mm -hmm. that no matter how dark, disturbing, or hopeless your cause seems to be, there is light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. there is reason to struggle, there is reason to hope. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I just adore that book. And it also has my absolute favorite quote because as an administrator, I go back to it over and over and over. And that quote is, power wrongly used defeats the oppressor as well as the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And I just love that quote. It mm -hmm. informs, hopefully, as many of my actions as an administrator as I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll definitely have to check that out. Um, <laughs> Well, the other purpose of Women at Iowa is to help future historians know a little bit more about women on our campus. So I'm wondering if you have a message to send to the future about some of the historical changes that we're seeing today. Oh, a message for the future. Um, I hope all of the action that's taking place right now mm -hmm. to rethink employment, to rethink the conditions under which employers can employ workers, mm -hmm to rethink how we determine equal treatment of workers, for example, part-time parity, mm -hmm. the way we conceptualize benefits, health care attached to a particular employer and a mm -hmm. particular job as opposed to health care being mm -hmm. something that's more universally provided. Uh, I hope that all of this talk that we're doing in the middle of this recession actually ends up bearing fruit mm -hmm. in a more rational and uh, a more contemporary understanding 
of how the economy should work. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the fundamentals of the economy is can this economy reproduce a healthy, educated, and productive population? Mm -hmm. And we're struggling with that right now. We're struggling with a middle class that feels disempowered, that feels like it's declining. Uh, we're struggling with child poverty. We're struggling with our educational system. We're definitely struggling with our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And all of these are, for me, work and family issues. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I'm looking at this contemporary historical period and I'm thinking, we, we are at a moment of change. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of really smart people out there generating a lot of really smart ideas. Mm -hmm. And I hope that some of them come to fruition and that the groundwork that we've tried to lay out as intellectuals gets picked up mm -hmm. and put into public policy and gets sustained. Mm -hmm. I really want things to be better for my daughters. Mm -hmm. I really want them to not have to struggle the way that I struggled in my career. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to see talented women any longer deciding that they simply can't work the way their employers want to work and be good parents at the same time. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be an enormous waste, mm -hmm. an enormous waste for our economy, for employers, but also an enormous waste for our children mm -hmm. because any parent that is only at home and is not employed is not bringing resources in that would help that child. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we can fix all of these. And I'm just hopeful and optimistic that 10, 20, 30 years from now, people will look back and they'll say, oh yes, thanks to people like you, now we have good public policies. <laughs> Just like I look back at the women who protested selective admissions and mm -hmm. single sex Ivy League schools helped me get scholarships and mm -hmm. opened up opportunities for me. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Women at Iowa.